بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد وفي قاسة سورة الفاتحة سورة الفاتحة that what we want to do by the night Allah is mention a few issues that pertain to Surah Al-Fatiha in brief without getting into the sticky details of the ikhtilafat of the scholars of Islam but a few brief isharat we want to point out and steer your attention and the direction of a few issues that pertain to Surah Al-Fatiha and inshallah ta'ala this can be applicable to the other surahs you get the idea uh, then we want to mention a few uh, virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha a few virtues in its importance and then we will take our simple tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha and inshallah ta'ala we don't want to get into the different views the different opinions we don't want it to be a, a scholarly in-depth discussion we want it to be a simple easy step by step tafsir for the everyday Muslim and for the beginning student of knowledge khairan inshallah so we're going to briefly skim through the tafsir of Ibn Kathir with regards to some of those issues and some of its virtues the first issue in brief is is Surah Al-Fatiha uh, Mecca or Madani is it something that it was sent down in the Meccan period or the period of Medina and before we go that far what's meant by these two terms they'll be explained in our further lessons on usul at tafsir in brief to give you the answer not to leave you hanging many people say mufti you always leave the people on cliffhangers you always leave the people hanging we do it oftentimes intentionally but not to do that here a meccan surah is not a surah that is sent down in Mecca in most cases that's the obviously the title but the scientific definition of a Meccan surah is a surah that is sent down before Hijrah a surah that is sent down before the Hijrah but in most cases obviously Al-Hukm Lil Ghalib in most cases the surah is being sent down in Mecca but not all of the time such as the ayat about the jinn listening to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, huh? and that was after he came back from Ta'if he was coming back from Ta'if huh? after the year in which khair, khair, we'll stop there the, the Madanian surah is the surah that sent down after the hijrah and it doesn't have to necessarily be in Medina but in most cases that is the surah that is revealed in Medina but not all of the time there's certain surahs that were sent down after the Prophet's Hijrah outside of Medina, such as إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ إِذَا زُنْزِلَةَ الْأَرْضُ زِنْزَالَهَا لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ etc. Khairan insha'Allah ta'ala, according to some of the people of knowledge with regards to some of those surahs being Medini surahs, but they weren't sent down inside of Medina. Or the ayat from Surah Al-Ma'idah, pertaining to the Hajj and things like this. Khairan inshaAllah ta'ala. He says that it is a Uhi Makkiya, that is a Meccan surah. Wakila Madaniya. Wa yukalu nazalat maratain maratan bi Mecca wa maratan bil Medina wal awalu ashbah. Some scholars say that it's Madani, or some say it's Makki. And as we said, we're not going to mention a khilaf unless we have to pertain to the actual tafsir. We'll briefly mention the issues pertaining to the issues, like we just said. Some say it's Meccan, some say it's Medanian or Medanin, um, and some say that it was sent down twice. Some say it was sent down twice, once in Mecca and once in Medina, and the correct view is the first, is that Surah Al-Fatiha is a Meccan Surah. We hear several ayat in bila khilafin. Surah Al-Fatiha has seven verses without any difference of opinion. Without any difference of opinion, it has seven verses. وَإِنَّمَا اخْتَلَفُوا فِي الْبَسْمَلَةِ هَلْ هِيَ آيَةٌ مُسْتَقِلَةٌ مِنْ أَوَّلِهَا كَمَا هُوَ الْمَشْهُورُ عَنْ جُمْهُورُ الْقُمْرَاءِ الْكُفَةِ وَقَوْلِ جِمَاعَةٍ مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ بِتَابِعِينَ وَخَلْقِ مِنَ الْخَلَفِ أَوْ بَعْضُ آيَةٍ أَوْ لَا تُعَدُّ مِنْ أَوَّلِهَا بِالْكُلِيَّةِ كَمَا هُوَ قَوْلُ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مِنَ الْقُرَاءِ وَالْفُقَهَاءِ 
على ثلاثة أقوال سيأتي تقريرها في موضعه إن شاء الله تعالى وبه الثقة He says here Surah Al-Fatiha is seven verses There's no difference of opinion of any scholar That is of seven verses and only seven verses The scholars only differ on the issue of saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim The Basmala Is the Basmala The act of saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Is it a separate verse? And this is the well-known view of most of the reciters from Kufa and a large number of Sahaba and Tabi'een and scholars who came later on? Or is it a part of an ayah? Is it a part of an ayah? It's not a separate ayah. The second view. Third and final view, or is it not an ayah at all? It's placed there, but it isn't an ayah. It isn't a verse by itself. Okay, which is the opinion of the people of Medina. So there are three views. Some say it is an ayah. Some say it's half of an ayah. And some say that it isn't an ayah. But it is not to be confused and jumbled up with the issue of how many ayat there are in Surah Al-Fatiha. There are only seven. Khair, inshallah ta'ala. The next issue is from the names of Surah Al-Fatiha. From the names of Surah Al-Fatiha. Obviously, we have Umm Al-Kitab. Umm Al-Kitab. As some may say, Umm Al-Kutub. But the Umm Al-Kitab, the literal translation is the mother of the book. I'm not too pleased with that translation. And I would say the foundation of the book. The foundation of the book for several reasons. Which we're not going to explain. The foundation of the book. Surah Al-Fatiha includes and entails the main objectives of the Qur'an as a whole. Khairan inshallah. Also, it is called Al-Fatiha as we know. It's the beginning of the Mus'haf. It opened, the Mus'haf is open with the Fatiha. It is also called As-Sab'ul Mathani. As-Sab'ul Mathani. The seven oft repeated It's an issue that is Or something that's often repeated Or is uh, constantly done again in the salah Naam Khairan inshallah ta'ala Also the uh, Fatiha Has the name of Ashifa, The cure The cure, remedy When Muslims feel pain Or they feel sickness Using the Fatiha for cure and remedy Spiritual cure huh? Ar-Ruqya Ruqya, which is a little translation when we translate Ruqya as a spell, meaning an incantation, meaning reciting on someone who's injured, or reciting on someone who is possessed, uh, some type of exorcist, uh, or uh, exorcism, excuse me, the Ruqya, the Muslims, reading on someone, someone who's possessed by jinn, someone who has sihr, sorcery, or just someone who's ill, reciting on yourself, or reciting on your children, Ruqya. Khairan inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala And there are other names and titles as well uh, Some of them are Al-Quran Al-Azim The Grand Quran Etc Khairan inshallah As far as the virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha Then there are many In the authentic sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Alayhi salatu wasalam From them uh, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala He says I'm reading from the Mukhtasar The summarized version He says روى الإمام أحمد عن أبي سعيد بن المعلى رضي الله عنه قال كنت أصلي فدعاني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلم أجبه حتى صليت فأتيت فقال ما منعك أن تأتيني قال قلت يا رسول الله إني كنت أصلي قال ألم يقول الله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا استجيبوا لله وللرسول إذا دعاكم لما يحييكم ثم قال لو علم أنك أعظم صورة في القرآن قبل أن تخرج من المسجد قال فأخذ بيدي فلما أراد أن يخرج من المسجد قلت يا رسول الله إنك قلت لو علم أنك أعظم صورة في القرآن قال نعم الحمد لله رب العالمين هي السبع المثاني والقرآن العظيم الذي أوتيته رواه ورواه البخاري وابو داود والنسائي وابن ماجة He says that there is a hadith that is reported by 
Abu Sa'id ibn al Mu'alla. The companion's name is Abu Sa'id ibn al Mu'alla. He says, One day I was offering prayer, and the Messenger of Allah he called me. But I didn't respond, I didn't reply. He was making his voluntary prayer. He says, Until I finished my entire prayer. Uh, then I went to him, and the Messenger of Allah he reproached me by saying, What stopped you from coming to me? Didn't I call you? I said, of course, O Messenger of Allah, but I was making the Salah, I was making prayer. The Messenger of Allah said, he then says, but doesn't Allah say in the Quran, O you who believe, respond to the command of Allah and His Messenger when He calls you to that which will give you life. Respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger when they call you to that which will give you life. The Messenger of Allah said, he then said, I'm going to teach you the greatest surah in the Qur'an before you leave the masjid. Before you leave the masjid, I'll give you the greatest chapter of the Qur'an. So the Messenger of Allah says, and he grabbed my hand, and we proceeded to leave. And when we were about to step outside of the masjid, I said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, didn't you promise me that you would teach me the greatest surah in the Qur'an? The Messenger of Allah, والسلام, he says, Yes, I did. And he said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. All praises for Allah, the Rabb of the Alameen. That is the greatest surah in the Quran, Ayy the Fatiha. And in the science of tafsir, sometimes an entire surah is given a name or title from one verse, or the verse itself is the title. He says, This is the Sabu al Mathani, the seven oft repeated, and it is the Quran al Azim. It is the great recited thing that I have been given. And this hadith has been collected by Imam Al-Bukhari, by Imam Abu Dawood, by Imam Al-Nasai, by Imam Ibn Majah, and many others. So this hadith, it goes to show uh, that the Fatiha is the greatest chapter of the Qur'an. Uh, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he also mentions uh, that this proves that there are verses in the Qur'an and there are uh, uh, surahs, chapters of the Qur'an which are more virtuous than others and that doesn't mean that there are parts of the Qur'an which are deficient and lacking. It doesn't mean that, but um, there are some that are greater than others. Khairan inshaAllah ta'ala. Another hadith that he mentions regarding the virtue of Surah Al-Fatiha he says, وَقَدْ رَوَى الْبُخَارِ عَنَ بِسَعِيدٍ الْخُضْرِي قَالَ كُنَّا فِي مَسِيرٍ لَنَا فَنَزَلْنَا فَجَاءَتْ جَارِيَةٌ فَقَالَتْ إِنَّ سَيِّدَ الْحَيِّ سَنِيمٌ وَإِنَّ نَفَرَنَا غُيَّبْ فَهَلْ مِنْكُمْ رَقٍ فَقَامَ مَعْهَا رَجُلٌ مَا كُنَّا نَأْبِنُهُ بِرُقْيَةٍ فَرَقَاهُ فَبَرَعَ فأمر له بثلاثين شاع وسقانا لبنا فلما رجع قلنا له أكنت تحسن رقية أو كنت ترقي قال لا ما رقيت إلا بأم القرآن قال لا ما رقيت إلا بأم الكتاب قلنا لا تحدث شيئا حتى نأتي أو نسأل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلما قدمنا المدينة ذكرناه للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال وما كان يدريه أنها رقية اقسموا واضربوا لي بسهم ورواه مسلم وأبو داود وفي بعض روايات مسلم لهذا الحديث أنا با سعيد هو الذي رقى ذلك السليم يعني اللديغ يسمونه بذلك تفاؤلا He says Imam al-Bukhari quotes a uh, hadith reported by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri رضي الله عنه he says, one day we were traveling and we sat down to take a rest. We sat down to take a rest. Meaning, when they got out of the desert, they reached a neighborhood, a town, village, an oasis, and they, they took a rest. And all of a sudden, a young maid came. This young female servant, she said that the leader of this village is Salim. This goes to show you the deepness of the Arabic language. 
she says that the leader of the village is Salim. The word Salim in Arabic literally means someone who's healthy, someone who's fine. And she meant that he was ladigh, he was huh, bitten by a venomous creature, whether it was a snake or a scorpion or a spider, something bit him that had venom. He was sick. He was in, going through a fever, going through shock, whatever. He was sick. Something bit him. But she calls him Selim. The Arabs, they say, as Ibn Kathir mentions, they switch up the word to fa'ulan, meaning trying to be positive and optimistic. She called him healthy even though he was very sick. Hmm? So she says that our leader has been stung. Uh, is in, 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 uh, and in and and most of the people that are in our village or this town, those who are doctors or reciters, they're going, they're traveling. So is there one who can do a ruqya from among you? Is there anyone who can do a ruqya from among you? So somebody from among us, he stood up. And we never knew that he was a raqi, that he is someone who did raqi. We didn't, we, we, didn't, we didn't do this. Farakahu. So he gave the man the ruqya. He read on the man the ruqya. Fabara'ah. So the man instantly and immediately became healed. He was no longer sick. Uh, so the chief, as a reward and as a token of gratitude and appreciation, he gave him 30 sheep. He gave him 30 sheep. And if you've ever been to an animal farm or petting zoo or actually been to a place in which people uh, uh, actually have livestock out in the wild, 30 sheep is a lot of sheep. Okay, if you've ever been to Scotland or the countryside of England, if you've ever been overseas or wherever you go in which they have sheep, that's a lot of sheep. Just think about 30 bodies. 30 sheep, 30 goat, saying ba and that. That's a lot of wool and a lot of fur. It's a lot of animals. As in other words, it was money, monetary compensation he gave the man for reciting the Quran on him. So he, they gave him 30 heads, uh, and they also gave them fresh milk to drink. Fresh milk to drink. So therefore, we left. Uh, and we asked the man, did you know Rukia? Were you a Raqi? Did you have skill in this before? He says, no. Ma raqaytuhu illa bi um al-kitab. He says, the only thing that I recited on him was the Fatiha. Was um al-kitab. So the companions were dumbfounded. And they were doubtful. And they said, let's not do anything until we get back to Medina. Until we get back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And ask him personally about, is this permissible? Is this correct? What should we do? So therefore, when they got back to Medina, they told the Prophet the story. The Prophet said, says, and how did you know that it was a ruqya? What allowed you to know that it is a ruqya? And he then confirmed the validity that, uh, of what he did, and that it is a ruqya, by saying, look at the beauty of the Prophet's words and his actions as a leader. Actions speak louder than words. He said, Give me a portion of the sheep. Give me a share or a lot of the sheep. In other words, he didn't say it's permissible to take the sheep. He says, give me one. Give me two. Give me three. In other words, it's totally permissible. And it's so permissible that I wish to get some of your spoils. Look at a charismatic leader. And that was more profound than him just saying, yes, it's permissible to take the sheep, to take the Monetary compensation. Uh, Ibn Kathir says in this hadith is also uh, found in the Sahih of Imam Muslim and the Sunan of Imam Abi Dawood. And other versions of this hadith state that the one who recited the, the Fatiha was actually Abu Sa'id al Khudri. Khayran, inshallah ta'ala. So that's brief with regards to certain issues and some of the virtues of Surah Al Fatiha. Now let's get started with the actual tafsir. Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, or before we read it, you know, from the etiquettes of reciting the Quran is to do al isti'adha. Huh? Allah says that when you recite the Quran, fasta'idh. He says, seek Allah's refuge from the shaitan al rajim, the cursed shaitan. So we say, a'udhu billahi min ash shaitan al rajim, 
You see Allah's refuge from the cursed devil. And there's a long explanation with regards to that. What's important is, is that al seeking Allah's refuge is worship. And it should only be done with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it basically means I'm running from something that causes me fear, that causes me terror, something that is harmful and dangerous. And I'm running towards someone who's most powerful, who has the most strength, who is totally omnipotent and has master of all things, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeking refuge in Allah from something that you fear. And a shaitan who was once Iblis until or when he was cast from the company of the angels, he was never an angel because he refused to bow down to Adam. He had pride in his heart and prejudice, okay? And he was called shaitan. Yani, and the scholars of Islam say that the word shaitan sometimes means ba'uda wa shtadda for something that's far, something that's remote, and something that's severe. Severe and formidable. So the shaitan became far from Allah's mercy, remote from any good, totally damned. And he became, he says, wa shtadda, shadeed, severe and strong, formidable, pure evil with a great amount of power and strength. And rajim, yani, the word rajim, literally means to stone someone, to throw stones at somebody, to hit someone with stones, pelt someone with stones, meaning he's far away. When we throw rocks at a cat, the cat runs. There's a wild dog on the street. You throw a rock. You don't hit the dog with a rock, but you toss the rock to scatter. Get out of here, scram, and the dog runs away. Huh? So that's what's meant by al istiada And then we have Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, uh, the translation of which is in the name of Allah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. And we've previously explained the scholars of Islam differ on whether the Bismillah is from the Fatiha or not. Huh? As far as in the Salah, then a person should not recite the Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim out loud, but just start off by saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. As far as the meaning of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then it's basically asking for barakah, for blessing. It's asking for help, for aid, and for assistance from Allah, the true deity of worship, the only one true God, who is ar-Rahman and ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman meaning he's the ever merciful, all of the time. Allah was always merciful, and he will always be merciful to everyone in one form or another. And Ar-Rahim, meaning the one who shows mercy at times and in places and to individuals in situations. Ar-Rahim is a mercy that is selective when Allah chooses and wills to give it. Ar-Rahman to everyone, Rahim to the Muslims. Ar-Rahman in this life and Rahim in the hereafter. Allah says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All hamd, all praises are for Allah, the Lord of the Alameen. This verse means all praises. It doesn't necessarily mean thanks, but it's meaning thana, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for Allah who is Rabb, the creator, the sustainer, the cherisher, the one who runs the universe and everything that is in existence. And all things besides Allah are from the Alamun. The grammatical uh, structure will make it to say Alamin. So the jinn are from the Alamin. The Prophet Muhammad is from the Alamin. Human beings are from the Alamin. Animals are from the Alamin, etc. So this verse, we benefit from it. Establishment of Tawheed al ilahiya Tawheed al uluhiya Is that worship is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, the Quran and Surah the Fatiha establishes Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, we just explained that. Malik Yawm Al-Din, the owner of the Day of Judgment, the king of the Day of Judgment, the ruler of the Day of Judgment, the wisdom behind Allah mentioning this, even though he is the owner of all days and the owner of all situations, is that there are people who reject Allah Azza wa Jal and belie Allah Azza wa Jal. 
There are people who say that Allah doesn't own anything. There's no God. There's no religion. There's nothing. But on that day, everyone will accept and everyone will acknowledge and everyone will avow. So that's the secret behind Allah Azza wa mentioning that. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And that previous verse explains and affirms resurrection. Is that there is and there will be resurrection. Lord or the owner of the day of a deen. A deen is recompense. All that you did, good and bad, you'll be brought accountable for. So that affirms resurrection. You alone, we worship and you alone, we ask for help. This ayah establishes Tawheed al-Ibadah once more. Is that worship is for Allah and only Allah. And that's because in Arabic, it doesn't say, Na'buduka, we worship you. But it says, Iyaka na'budu. Yani, we only worship you. So this affirms Tawheed. And the Tawheed of Allah Azawajal is not from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. It's not from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab to only worship Allah and the to slaughter for other than Allah, to swear by other than Allah, to make tawaf around graves, to seek the help from jinn, to seek the refuge of jinn, and to invoke dead ancestors. That being shirk is not from Ibn Abdul Wahhab. That is Islam. So it says, you alone we worship, and you alone we seek help. Meaning, in the things which only Allah can do. It doesn't mean that you can't seek help from someone, your family member, a wife seeks the help of her son. The husband seeks the help from his wife. And the things that they have the human ability to do. So this verse shows us is that we worship Allah and only Allah. That's Tawheed. And it goes to show us that we have to ask Allah's help. And that Allah is the one who gives the slave the ability to worship him. And who gives him the success. So you can never ever be without thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're always indebted to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is half and half as we say. Half ibadah and half isti'ana, as is mentioned in other parts of the Qur'an. Moving forward, Allah Azza wa Jalla then says, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ mustaqim," Guide us to the straight path. Meaning, the path of beneficial knowledge and the path of righteous actions. This means, make us Muslims and keep us Muslims. Make us righteous and keep us righteous. The purpose of you saying this, even though you've already been a Muslim, you've accepted Islam, you were born and raised as a Muslim, is to bolster that which you already have and to ask for that which you don't have. Ask for an increase. Ask for more. So solidify your capital sums and then go out with the intention of making more money but not losing anything from your original capital. صراط الذين أنأمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Allah says that this is the path this is the path uh, of those whom you have blessed, the believers, they say. Guide us to the straight path. The straight path is the path of those whom you have blessed. And do not lead us to the path, the path of those who have earned your anger, nor the path of those who went astray. So this ayah, we learn from it. Further clarification. Allah said, guide us to the straight path, and then it's, it's clarification of what the straight path is. Uh, and the straight path is very simple and very easy. Those who are blessed and those who are cursed. The blessed were the prophets and the messengers and their people, the Muslims of all generations. The followers of Moses were Muslims. The followers of Jesus in his time were Muslims. The followers of Abraham in his time, they were Muslims. And they are those who took the beneficial knowledge of their prophets and messengers and then followed it up with righteous action. And not the path of those who earned your anger by learning what was correct and not doing it, not implementing it, not acting upon it. Okay? Including the Jews and anyone else who uh, fits the description. What are Darlene, nor those who went astray, those who who didn't learn, and they loved God, but upon ignorance. They loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon ignorance, upon jahl, the worship of their forefathers, whether that, and, or that includes the Christians and anyone who fits their descriptions, even though 
that the Jews have become the maghdub alayhim and the dalun. They're both. Not only are they, they have earned Allah's anger, but they're also astray. But their distinguishing feature was that they gained Allah's anger. And the Christians have also become the maghdubi alayhim, those whom Allah is angry with. And they're also astray. But their distinguishing feature was ignorance and the love and the worship of Allah. So they went astray. So this verse, uh, it clearly proves that. And it's also an example of how certain things are not to be politically correct in the Qur'an. And it can never ever be. And it's impermissible for a person to give a new, modern, progressive interpretation. And you say, you can't say that this verse is talking about the Jews and the Christians. You can't say that. That's offensive and that's disrespectful to someone else's religion, etc. There are many benefits pertaining to Surah Al-Fatiha. And there are many issues that pertain to Fatiha. This is how we're going to make the tafsir. Simple, quick, easy, brief. Every now and then we'll mention a subtle benefit here and there sporadically. And Allah Azza wa knows best.